السلام عليكم ورحمة الله جزاك الله خيرا for uh, the elaborate uh, presentation I always get a kick when people call me Sheikh uh, um, we go ان شاء الله and formally start أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين I begin in the name of Allah the creator of heavens and earth the sustainer the cherisher the provider the source of our guidance I invoke his peace and blessing upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad and I ask Allah to shower his blessings upon each and every one of you for coming out uh, tonight to listen to this lecture and to learn. Uh, I ask Allah to increase the Iman in your hearts, uh, to protect you from the trickery of Shaytan, uh, to accept your dua, uh, to forgive your shortcomings, uh, to multiply your uh, good deeds. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant you your wishes in the life of this world uh, and to bless you with the ultimate prize uh, his Jannah, Allah uh, It's, um, I don't say this just because I'm here, and it is not uh, something that I say to uh, every group I address, but it, it honestly is true. Out of all uh, speaking assignments I get invited to, the one that excite me, excites me the most is, is when I address students. Uh, and, and this has, not, it has nothing to do with the, my constant nostalgic attachment to uh, the days of college. You know, if, if, you go to, if you go to school for so long, like I did, uh, it becomes so difficult to detach yourself from academia and actually face the, the real world. Uh, you prefer to stay in your little uh, intellectual cocoon for as long as possible, uh, but eventually you have to start a family and raise children. Uh, so uh, at the expense of your desire to stay in the university environment for so long, uh, you have to do what you need to do. Uh, so it's not because of that nostalgia that I say this. It is primarily because uh, I feel that uh, in this day and age, uh, I, I graduated college uh, about eight years ago, seven years ago, when I finished my master's. But when I was doing my undergrad, you know, things were not like this. Right? We, were, we hardly had anybody coming to, uh, uh, to our MSA meetings mostly graduate students, mostly immigrants. And to see so many young people uh, who uh, had other choices, who had other enticements, who had other things to do on, on a Thursday night, coming to the masjid uh, or, or coming to an MSA meeting or coming to a lecture to learn, to further their knowledge, to get closer to Allah. I really see a miracle in that. I see a miracle because the doors of all evil things are wide open everywhere. And, uh, and just seeing you guys uh, with, with all of this diversity really just inspires me. And that in and of itself just puts some really, really fuzzy feelings in my heart. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I truly admire your courage and uh, I commend you for, uh, for the striving that you go through every single day to make this conscious choice, uh, living as a Muslim in America. I mean, this is no joke. This is, this is a very difficult thing. Uh, you know, I, I lived in the dorms, uh, and, and, I, and I know how it is, you know, most of you probably don't live in the dorms, but I lived in the dorms, and, and it was really bad. Uh, it, was, it was all about partying and drinking and girls hitting on guys and guys hitting on girls, that's, that's how it was. And, and I stood out as the one guy who doesn't have any partner, right? And that became a subject of discussion. Right? What is wrong with this guy? Uh, and, and to go around everyone and to talk to them about Islam and the lifestyle we choose and, and, and the difficulty of, of having to deal with that, you know, is, is one that I, I was, I gladly got myself involved in. Uh, and, and I think that you probably have to, to a lesser degree, have to deal with that on a regular basis. So that in and of itself, I think, is very, very inspiring. Uh, you might not see it, but as an outsider, I, I see it when I come here. And, and I think it is, um, from, from this perspective, it would be natural, I think, for us to talk about hearts, right? Because we're talking about the 
illnesses or the diseases of the heart. Uh, and uh, I tell you, you know, flat out, you know, before I even say anything, uh, just your presence uh, increased my iman. You know, and I, and I say that with with sincerity. And I think that happens with all of us. You know, when we see our brothers and sisters, just this collective spirit that we have. As, as Muslim students on campus, I, I think that in and of itself, you know, even if a tiny bit, but it does increase your iman, and it does have a positive impact uh, on your heart. But see, just like the physical body uh, falls ill, our hearts also get ill, right? Uh, and, and as the scholars of the Tabi'in used to say, the cure of that illness is mainly repentance, right? To ask Allah to forgive you. Just like the physical body gets dirty, our hearts get dirty as well. And the way to polish them is through dhikr, as Tabi'in used to say, you know, mentioning Allah's names and, and remembering Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, just like uh, our physical bodies get starved, right? Our hearts starve as well. And the nutrition of those hearts, you know, Tabi'in say, it's ma'rifatullah. Ma'rifa is, is a profound word. I can spend days giving lectures about the word ma'rifa. You know, I, I, I roughly translate this as the, the, the collective epistemology of the meaning of God. His, his attributes, his qualities, his characteristics, his creation, his impact, his regulatory power of the universe, his control, his wisdom. Everything that has to do with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is something that we need to know. It's something that we need to understand. And that's, what, that's the nutrition of the heart, right? If water and food are the nutrition of the physical body, ma'rifatullah azza wa jal, knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that detailed sense is the nutrition of the hearts. But unfortunately, harshness, right, has become the name of the game. Uh, especially in the Western world, you're taught these things. You're taught that you are the center of the universe, that you need to pursue what you want even if it's at the expense of friends or family. It doesn't matter what your parents say. It doesn't matter what social obligations or, or expectations suggest. What matters is what you want. And with that, you can step on any toes. You can trample over people, right, in order to pursue your own dreams, right, with no consideration whatsoever to other things that Islam teaches. Uh, they tell you, you need to be harsh, you need to have thick skin, to be able to survive. People who demonstrate an ounce of weakness, right, are eaten alive, right? They teach you such things. Even, even social gestures that we are taught at a young age that are meant to smooth out uh, otherwise complex social relations, uh, you know, such as saying good morning in the, when you see somebody or smiling at people's faces, right, or just being nice in general, it is all fabricated, it is all superficial, it is all meaningless because it does not reflect a true value that has settled in people's hearts, right? So they smile in this customer service mentality, all right. But then when you turn around, right, there's, there's absolutely no connection. And it is also interesting to see that uh, in the Western world, for the most part, I think we have everything we want and we have everything we need. I mean, think about it, you know, uh, despite the economic crisis, Compared to people, let's say, Bogadishu, for example, any Somalis in the room? There's a sister from Somalia, there's a brother from Somalia right there. They, they say that Somalia is the, you know, the, 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 the worst failing state on earth, right? Uh, and, and, you know, I, I know so many people from Somalia, they're really wonderful people, so you just ask yourself. You know, in, in America, we have our shelter, our homes, we have our cars, means of transportation, we have Food, plenty, plenty of it, right? We have all kinds of, of resources. Uh, we have luxuries, we have electronics, we have a pretty efficient government system. Uh, we have uh, paved roads and highways. We have a pretty robust educational system, not as robust as most of us would like it to be. Uh, but compared to other parts of the world, we're doing all right. But still, most of us feel that something is missing, right? Going about our daily lives, we feel that something is missing. We're not happy as we should be. Why are we not happy? Right? You, you go to college and then you have all kinds of dreams and plans 
I graduate, I do this, I do that, I get married, I have children, I start a family, I get a job, I make that much money. And then when you reach everything you want, I promise you, I mean, you haven't reached that level yet, but you almost go into a stage where suicide becomes an option on the table. And, and I promise you, there are actually surveys where most people who have passed the age of 35 and they have stable jobs, stable families, and stable lives, they've contemplated suicide at some point. Why is it that people have everything, but they're so depressed, right? The largest, the largest uh, aspect, you know, well, not the largest, but one of the largest aspects of, of the drug industry in the United States is antidepressants. The largest market for antidepressants in this country is children under the age of five. Can you believe this? I, little little uh, preschoolers. The, the fastest growing market for antidepressants in the United States is preschoolers. Did you hear about this before? There are millions and millions of preschoolers who need antidepressant medication. Right? Compare that to my brothers and sisters in Somalia, a failing state, right? But I promise you, people in Somalia are not depressed. They're angry, but they're not depressed. They cannot afford depression. See, depression is a postmodernistic luxury. Depression is something that only people like us can afford. But people in Somalia, they cannot afford to get depressed. You know why? Because they wake up in the morning, they need to survive. They need to work so hard to feed kids under the most difficult of circumstances. They get angry, but they cannot afford to get depressed like us. That's a luxury. Depression is a luxury. The highest rates of suicide in the world are not in Somalia or Pakistan or, or uh, Ethiopia or Kenya or you know other countries that are having a hard time. The highest, as a matter of fact, the rates of suicide are directly proportional to per capita GNP. Did you hear about that? The rates of suicide are, again, directly proportionate to per capita GNP, meaning that the highest rates of suicide are in the most industrialized countries, in the wealthiest countries with people making, making a lot of money, way more than the US, Sweden, and, and other countries in Europe. That's interesting. And, and why is that happening? Because people continue to feed that physical body of theirs, and they completely ignore the other, the other part of their existence that is their qalb. And, and it's very important for me to write this on the board, because I want you guys to make some important distinctions. This is what we're talking about tonight. When we say the diseases or the illnesses of the heart, we're talking about qalb, we're not talking about H-E-A-R-T. Okay, and I'll tell you what the difference is in a second. Why is it that when I have a stomach ache, when I have a, a headache, when I have a kidney problem, when I have this or that that has to do with my physical being, I go out there and find the best uh, uh, physician possible, uh, and I have an insurance plan, and I do my due diligence, and there's a family doctor, and there's this and that. But when it comes to the illnesses of the heart, we have no remedy for that whatsoever. Why? Why do you think that's the case? Because, here's what the Tabi'in said, and brothers and sisters, I've been teaching this stuff for Wallahi, about 10 years. But every time I read or teach these things, I, my heart trembles. My heart trembles because these are, these are really scary facts of life. Okay, this is what the Tabi'in used to say. When I say Tabi'in, by the way, for those of you who don't understand the term, the Tabi'in, that's a generation of Muslim scholars that learned Islam at the hands of the Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet So it's the subsequent generation that came after the Prophet So the scholars of Tabi'in used to say, Curing heart illness is so difficult and is so daunting of a task because, number one, it is so tough to detect heart illness. It is so tough. Because people indulge everything in life and they're taught that it's okay to have desires that are haram and illicit. It is okay to want these things. It is okay to gorge on these amounts of food. Right? If you, if there is, you know, the, the scholars, you know, Hiya Ulum al-Din, Imam Muhammad al-Ghazali, he talks about amrad uh, al-Butun, uh, the illnesses of the of the bellies, and he talks about people who who gorge massive amounts of sugary items, like who who love candy. I mean, today we we say that they just love candy, right? He has a he has a sweet tooth, 
right? We have developed euphemism to define things that are otherwise reprehensible, according to the teachings of those early scholars. So people, he considers it an illness of the heart for someone to want to gorge on massive amounts of sugary things. Look at how we look at these things today. We might approach it from a health standpoint, but that's it. We don't consider it an illness of the heart to want so much of these uh, uh, unnecessary, uh, ephemeral, transient, or fleeting uh, desires of the life of this world that will not contribute to any healthy existence, that will certainly not contribute to any healthy hereafter. Right? So, they say, so we are gorging on these things. We are watching inappropriate material on television. We are listening to horrible music. Right? And we, we, can't, we can't really see that that is a reflection or a demonstration of a deep-seated illness in our hearts. Why? Because everyone else is doing it. And we are taught to believe that if everyone else is doing it, then it has to be okay. You know, as little kids, our very first alibi, our very first uh, response to any accusation by our parents, well, my, bro my brother did it. Remember that? Did that ever work with your parents? When my kids use that argument with me, just dis dismissed out of hand, complete. I always teach my kids, it doesn't matter what 99% of the people do, you have to look at what you're doing and assess it independently, right? Sometimes they, you know, they, they really, they're unable to fathom such complex notions, but I'm, I'm making sure that they understand this so they just don't go with the wave, just flow with the, with the wave and do what everyone else is doing. Once you've done that, you completely lose the ability to detect and diagnose the illnesses of the heart. Right? So number one, it is so difficult to diagnose. Number two, if you are somehow miraculously been able to diagnose it, it is so hard and difficult to find a qualified therapist. Right? I mean, I'll ask you a question. How many of you heard of a heart therapist in this area? Okay, I'm glad that nobody referred to a really great cardiologist at Kaiser or something. Because that, that's not what we're talking about. So it is so difficult to find a, a therapist for the illnesses of the heart. It's so rare to find someone like that who's, you know, even, even like Iman, I mean, I don't, most of them, I don't think they have the ability to handle it. I mean, they're all working on themselves. And if you are able to find somebody, that's number three, if you are able to find someone who can actually help you cure the illnesses of your heart, how can you be sure that that person is not him or her a victim of the same illnesses that he or she are set out, that he or she is set out to cure? Right? It's like going to uh, a cardiologist who tells you you need to stop smoking while puffing a big cigar. Right? Will you take his words seriously? Right? Or, or you go to the gym, and, and your personal trainer is like you know, 350 pounds. Will, will you ever take the words seriously? Right? So you have, a, you have a heart therapist who preaches what he or she doesn't practice. That's a complete waste. He will never take it seriously. And, and I think that's precisely why uh, the Tabi'in used to say something that, again, you know, shakes my foundations every time I read it, every time I teach it. And they say... All people are uh, doomed or uh, damned, except Muslims. And you know, I don't want you to misread this. Uh, there are two notions of the word Muslim. There is the theological slash historical notion, which is people who have subscribed to the organized movement that was called Islam, right? Uh, starting with the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam onwards. And then there is the more linguistic understanding of the word Muslim, which is the one that surrenders to Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala, And that encompasses a lot more than the... The latter encompasses a lot more than the former. Uh, there are many people who are considered Muslim by the second definition and not by the first definition. Does that make sense to you guys? Uh, that's another lecture in and of itself. So he says, all people, kullun nasi, all people are... Uh, damn except Muslim. And then he says, وَكُلُّ الْمُسْلِمُونَ هَلْكَ إِلَّا الْمُؤْمِنِينَ And all Muslims are damned except those who are true believers around them. It's 
getting scarier and scarier. Okay? وَكُلُّ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ هَلْكَ إِلَّا الْعَالِمِينَ And all true believers are damned except those who have ilm. Again, just defining the word ilm will take another lecture. Right? وَكُلُّ الْعَالِمُونَ هَلْكَ إِلَّا الْعَامِلِينَ and all those who have that knowledge are also damned, except those who act upon the knowledge, who implement it, who preach it, but also follow it and abide by it at the same time. وَكُلُّ الْعَامِلُونَ هَلْكَ إِلَّا الْمُخْلِصِينَ And all those who act upon the knowledge they have are also damned, except those who do it with pure and sincere intentions. And then he concludes the saying with something that really scares me every time I say it. وَالْمُخْلِصُونَ عَلَىٰ خَطَرٍ عَظِيمٍ People who are sincere in their intentions are in such great danger. Did you hear that before? I will give you a few seconds to absorb it because tonight I don't want you to listen with the ears and process with your minds. I want you guys to listen with this, this guy that we, that we often forget it exists with our hearts. Absorb these words. I... I can go out there in my Jum'ah and I talk to people about really hopeful things, right? And tell them about Allah's forgiveness and love and compassion and that Allah is not interested in admitting anyone to hellfire. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would rather that all of us go to Jannah and stuff like that. But honestly, brothers and sisters, since this is such a unique, exclusive group of, mashallah, good uh, Muslims and future leaders in their own right, I, I need to share with you the truth. You know, it is not looking good for... Because we have to deal with so many challenges and odds in this life, and we have to jump over so many barriers, and we have to remove so many hurdles in that extremely long and arduous and tumultuous journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the one resource that we need the most is a heart that is for the most heart for the most part corrupt. Do you understand how difficult this is? Again, let me repeat it. It's a very long and difficult journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in which we need to overcome so many challenges. And the one thing we need the most is the qalb, is our heart, and our hearts are so corrupted beyond imagination. You see why this tabi'i is so scared? He says even people are sincere. <laughs> they, are, they are in great danger. What is the, what is the human being made of? What are the three main components of, of the human being? So this is you. There is your physical body. And then there is the brain. And you can guess the third one is? So. Heart? This is what people see. Is this what Allah looks at? No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks at a parallel existence of each and every one of us. That is also composed of three things. The equivalent of physical body is? Actions. Huh? Actions. No. What? When I say, when I say, um, Ennis. When I call Ennis in the life of this world and dunya, I call him Ennis, right? And then on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will call him Ennis. What is the common denominator between those two individuals? So. Brain is equivalent to? Knowledge. Aql, and I will tell you what that means. Aql. And heart is equivalent to qalb. Right? Now, which of these two forms of existence is the human being? By the definitions of this earth, it's a combination of both that makes us human beings. If you're, if you're just this, that means you're dead. Right? If you're that, and this and that together, that is the human being. That's the composition of the human being. This is the Islamic understanding of what the human being is. Alright, so the physical body, this physical form, arms and legs and head and nose and stuff like that, that's just your physical body. But the true you 
is your soul. That's the enduring part of you. That's the one that lasts. That's the one that doesn't die. Right? Death is basically when your soul parts away with your, with your body. That's the definition of death. So the soul endures because the most kind of God created, created it. Uh, the brain is, you know, this uh, cortex right here, right? The difference between my brain and the brain of a higher chimpanzee is that I have aql, they don't. My brain has evolved in its functions, in its self-consciousness into aql, and, and that's what defines us as human beings, right? That's the difference between us and other, and other animals. And heart is not that little beating organ in our chests, that atrium ventricular, ventricles. Uh, the qalb we talk, we talk about is your conscience, right? Is your set of morals. Uh, is uh, choices you make that are sometimes going against rationality, but you do them because they're right. Do you understand the difference? Okay, so... Your qalb is the steering wheel. Just so that you really memorize this stuff. In the qalb, there is a small little thing that Allah created that uh, constitutes a compass, an inner compass that we call. Starts with an F. Fitra. Fitra. So there's a little... Your fitra is the code that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ingrained in our hearts to always tell us what's right and what's wrong. To make distinctions between things at the most difficult of circumstances, you will always be able to tell. Without religion, without Quran, without prophets, in the most tough of and difficult of times, you will still be able to tell what's right and what's wrong through the fitra. Right? So your fitra is the GPS. And the qalb is the steering wheel. Right now, where is the engine? The engine is your aql. Right? Again, the soul is, is just you. That's, that's a driver. Right? Now, in this picture, what constitutes the actual vehicle itself? This is your vehicle, right here. Now, I want someone who's really, really smart to tell me, in this analogy, what is gasoline? It's not written on the board. It's whatever you take in. Hmm? Like, whatever you take in from... Your environment, or like whatever you process. Okay, no, that that's an interesting, so not entirely accurate, but but I think I think you're you're mentioning a very important point. Yes. Your fate. Huh? Your fate. Fate. Hmm. It's not really. Yes. Your work. Your work. Not sure, because work changes all the time. Desires. Well, you know, I would I would consider desires to be, uh, I don't know, is it traffic lights. Is it things you learn? Cops <laughs> pulling you over. Is it yes. Is it like knowledge or attainment of like knowledge or what you take in? Knowledge. Is what if what if you what if you are in a place where you're stranded in the middle of an island and you have no access to information whatsoever? Where would you get that knowledge? Is it Iman? Close, close enough. Your gasoline is your ruh. Also translated as scary. Why do I say this? Because that's an independent, renewable source of energy. You know why? Because it comes directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't need anyone's help with that. How do I know this? He says in the Quran about Adam alayhi salam, فَإِذَا سَوَّيْتُهُ وَنَفَخْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِي when I created Adam, molded him into shape, and breathed into him from my own essence, that's ruh. It comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what drives you. That's the energy that keeps you going. Without it, you're dead. 
both physically and spiritually. <coughs> Do you guys have any questions about this? Yes? I had a question. Um, what was, what's the difference between spirit and soul? It's the, de the difference actually demonstrated on the board. Your soul is the entity in the universe that is you, that God created, right? The entity that is accountable. The entity that will experience uh, heaven and hell. The entity that acquires different forms, that lives in this body today, and on the day of judgment, live in another body, right? So, what was your name, sister? Layla. So, when, 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 when the universe asks about Layla, the only identifiable part of you that has your barcode is your soul. Not, 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 not your physical body. Ruh, or spirit, on the other hand, is the energy that provides this entity with life and ability to move and ability to think and to have memory and to make choices and so forth. I, I really wanted to make sure that this is clear because it is never discussed in such terms anywhere. So we get kind of confused about all these definitions and nafs and ruh and, and this and that. So I, I wanted to make sure that, that I put it in perspective for you guys, inshallah, so that you can write it down. So when the heart is corrupted, do you understand now the severity of the problem? Because the heart is the steering wheel. Can you operate a motor vehicle without a steering wheel? Or the faulty steering wheel? Try to make a right, it makes a left. That's where the problem comes from. So if we talk about the heart as being possibly one of the most important aspects of your existence, and we say that our hearts have become corrupted, have become so harsh, right? Uh, the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are mentioned and our hearts don't move. Our hearts are being irresponsive. You know, things that used to cause the Sahaba to cry don't even cause us to blink anymore, right? It has, it's completely different. And, you know, on, on one hand, we understand why this happens because our environment is so difficult and so distracting. But on the other hand, we, we, have a, we have a journey, we have a mission, right? And we need to get there, one way or another. And, and we need to make very, very important decisions in our lives if we were to be saved. You know, otherwise, uh, as the Quran says, we live in this world, we eat and drink and procreate just like animals, and then it's gonna be, that's going to be it. You know, at the age of 70, 75, 80, 90, if you're lucky, you're gone. What happens next? Let's talk about uh, symptoms, because some of us might think, you know, alhamdulillah, my heart is okay. There's nothing wrong with me. I don't have a, I don't have a problem. How do we, how can we tell? Because again, I told you it's so difficult to detect heart illness. How can we tell? How can you tell if you have a problem with your heart, with your heart? Uh, number one, the scholars call this at takasul an Indolence in matters of worship. You know what indolence is? Laziness. Just so difficult to do it. So every time you, it's prayer time, it's such a difficult thing for you to pray. You don't find excitement in your salah anymore. Right? It is, it is a checklist, a fajr check, lord check. And again, you know, see how ironic it is. I'm talking about people who actually pray to begin with. Imagine the vast majority of Muslims who don't even do their salah. They don't observe. You know, I'm Muslim, but you know, I'm not a practicing Muslim. I'm just Muslim. Right? I'm talking about people who practice their prayer, and they do it with indolence. You know, they have to drag their feet in order to do their salah. That's a sign of heart illness. Right? The Prophet وسلم, used to wait so impatiently for Bilal to say adhan. Right? And then when, when the circumstances of life get so difficult for him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would say, Ya Bilal, enough already. Please say adhan. I know it's not prayer time, but I can't wait. Do you feel that same way about salah? If you, if you, are, if you get an email today from Governor Brown to meet him in his office, you would probably feel, okay, I mean, what does he want? But I think in your heart you will feel an element of pride that 
the governor of the state of California singled you out in order to meet you, right? If you if you were in trouble, he would have he would have sent the cops. But he's sending you an email inviting you for a meeting, so it has to be a good thing, right? Now, if the president of the United States invites you to the White House and, and sends you plane tickets or you travel on Air Force One to go and visit him once in your life, whether you agree or disagree with his politics, I think you will feel a sense of pride. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator of heavens and earth, was much grander and larger than anything we could have ever imagined. He takes the time to be there to listen to us in our prayers five times every single day. And it seems that he is the one who is more keen about meeting us than us keen about meeting him. You see the, the irony of our relationship with Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator, who gave us everything, who gave us our health, our wealth, our, our families, our security, our education, who gave us our fitrah, who gave us Islam, everything we have, we owe it to him subhanahu wa ta'ala. But when he invites us to when he invites us to pray, to talk to him because he misses us, because he wants to have a conversation with us, we find it so difficult and tough, and most of us don't even do it. And those who do, they're like, okay, fine. I'm gonna go pray, because if I didn't, you know, it'll be a sin, and you know, I want I want my gender. See the approach? It's horrible. What we want from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the reward. We don't want him. He's not important, right? What I want is the is a transaction. I give you this, you give me that. But he's not in the picture. Right? He's not in the picture. I'm not interested in him. I'm interested in what he has to offer. But there's no connection with the creator of Jannah. There's no I don't worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he deserves to be worshipped, because he wants me to be close to him, because this is my way of communicating with him and talking talking to him. No, I don't I, I worship him because I want, you know, from 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 the give me, give me Jannah, that's all I want, that's all I care about, I don't care about anything else. Right? It is self interest that drives the process. Self interest. In in its worst form, in, in my judgment. When we treat Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in such disrespectful manner. If people only come to you, only smile in your face, because every time you smile, they, they smile in your face, you give them a dollar. If people only smile in your face, because every time you give them a candy or a reward, how would you feel about that? Otherwise, they would not even, you know, give a, a, a darn about who you are, or where you are, or what you do. How would you feel about that? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to put up with this every single second of the day. As he says in Al-Hadith Al-Qudsi, خَيْرِ لِلْعِبَادِ نَازِلْ وَشَرُّهُمْ إِلَيَّ صَعِيْ My goodness is constantly descending from on high upon my worshippers, and I get nothing in return that ascends up to me except their evil deeds. That's all I get. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is almost like, why? Why I do all these things to you? And, and you have to drag your feet to meet me. Am I, am I, am I that repulsive? I mean, am I that, am I that annoying? Am I irritating you? I am the one who caused you to exist. Otherwise, you would have been nothingness. Right? And when I invite you out of my might and, and, and grace, and out of my love and compassion, I invite you to have a meeting with me to, for us to talk. And you are the one who's going to benefit anyway. I'm not going to get anything out of this meeting. You are the one who's going to benefit. And you deny me that, and, and when you actually do do your salah, right? You're like, just thinking about a million things when you're doing your salah. You're not even able to focus and concentrate in those two or three minutes. When you meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Did I make it clear enough? Did I make that clear enough? So the, the lack of ability to see that is a severe, a severe symptom or sign of the, an illness in your heart. If you're unable to see it that way, there has to be a problem in there. Number two, lack of response to the Qur'an. Lack of response to the Qur'an. You know, the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba, we always hear these stories, right? They used to listen to this ayah and then they would cry. They used to listen to that ayah and then they'd cry. It's just, it moved their hearts. You can come up with excuses all the time. Hey, you know, I won't understand the language of the Qur'an. I don't understand. I speak a different language, right? We can make that excuse, and we continue. We can continue to make that excuse until the time we die. If that's your choice, then that's your choice. 
right? But if you choose otherwise, you will find a way to understand what Allah is trying to tell you in the Quran. When you read three or four or five different translations simultaneously, I promise you, you'll be able to grasp 95 or 98 percent of what the ayah is trying to say. And if that, in eventuality, does not move your heart, then there's a problem. Allah says in the description of the believers in the Quran, Surah Al-Anfal, the true believers are ones when God's name is mentioned, their hearts tremble in awe. And wajal, right? Not in fear. Tremble in awe, right? When the word Allah is mentioned. When the word ar rahman is mentioned. When the word ar rahim Al-Jabbar, Al-Mutakabbid, Al-Kareem, Al-Muqeet, Al-Dayyan, all these Beautiful God's names, the 99 names, you need to understand what they mean. And when, when they're said, your heart trembles, you only have goosebumps. Does that happen to you? It doesn't? There's a problem in there. If your heart does not respond to the Quran and the words of the Quran being recited so beautifully, resonating with such, with such uh, 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 eloquence and, and with such... Uh, depth and profundity, if, if your heart is not moved to the Qur'an, you know, I, there, there has to be a problem, and inshallah I'll tell you some tips on how to achieve that. Number three, lack of sensitivity to surrounding incidents. People die, massacres take place, natural disasters, and your heart doesn't move. Right? Seventy people were killed in a marketplace in Iraq, in Baghdad. We hear it every day, right? Your heart doesn't move to that anymore. Clashes between Sunnis and Shias in a Pakistani masjid. Don't care about it anymore. 75 people got killed in Egypt yesterday. Soccer rights, they say. Our hearts don't move to these things anymore. Yeah, whatever. It's as if we're talking about chickens. Well, lucky if 75 chickens are killed at the same time in, in, in such horrific manner, we would feel that. If 75 dogs were killed in one place, like if there, there's news, I think that people in this country, their hearts would move a lot more when they hear about a massacre of dogs as opposed to human beings. I promise you. I promise you. This is how numb we've become to human life. Right? And if our hearts don't feel bad when other people's lives are suffering, there has to be a problem in those hearts. Number four. Al-wala' b'maladzat al-dunya, Tabi'een said. Um, we're so fond of the pleasures of life. And we keep coming up with creative ideas to indulge more, right? We have become so creative when it comes to uh, entertainment. Uh, all kinds of gadgets and all kinds of programs on television, all kinds of different movies, right? To keep us constantly attached, constantly hooked, constantly dependent, right? On all forms of entertainment, clothes, we got so crazy, right, with, with our fashion designs and so on and so forth. When it comes to food, right, it's become an art in and of itself, in the food industry. You know, they tell you, like, there are people, companies, right, companies, who are hired for the sole purpose of making fast food look nice for a camera shoot. Do you hear about those companies? Right? Like, like people are employed that get salaries at the end of the year. Right? To sell falsehood to millions and millions of people. That's what they do. They sell falsehood. Right? All kinds of different pleasures in, in this life. We've indulged so much. We've gotten creative so much about those things uh, that it has really reached a point where pleasure has become an end in itself. Right? Pleasure is not a way to repel pain anymore. Pleasure has become an end in and of itself. And in the course of doing this, we keep satisfying the desires of that perishable aspects of us, and that is the physical body. Physical body is constantly being maintained, right? Always polished. Uh, always, uh, uh, you know, you take your physical body, you take your vehicle to the to the gas station to take care of it, to wash it, to you know, remove any spot here and there. But very little attention is paid to the engine. Very little attention is paid to the steering wheel that is rusting. Very little attention is paid to driver himself or herself. Number five, hearts don't glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala anymore. Allah is not being glorified. He's not, he's not put in his, in his rightful place 
in our minds and in our hearts. Let me ask you, when we see something that is really, really amazing, what do we normally say as Muslims? Huh? Subhanallah. We say Subhanallah. Right? We say Subhanallah. Do you know what that means? What, is, what, is, what, is it, what does it mean, Subhanallah? Glory to God. Glory to God. Sounds like a Christian thing, if you ask me. It doesn't mean glory to God. I mean, it sounds like that in English, but it doesn't mean glory to God. What does it mean? Subhanallah. Did you ever ask yourself, how, how often did you say Subhanallah? Do you know what Alhamdulillah means? No? Come on, guys. You better know what that means. Do you know what Allah Akbar means? <laughs> Subhanallah <coughs> means that I am removing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from any worldly or human description and totally uh, putting him in a completely different space, a completely different uh, uh, realm that has absolutely nothing with any form or description or, or perception or conception or understanding that I could ever have. That's what it means. Subhanallah. That you Allah... You are above anything I could ever think of. You are. You don't have any human attributes. You don't have any human qualities. You, you don't possess a quality that with my very limited mind I would be able to describe you with. Do you understand what that means? Right? It's called tanzih. Tanzih Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so great that you consider it a crime, a sin, to ascribe something fathomable to Him. That's called ta'zim. That's the glorif the true glorification of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just put him out there into an understanding that is so... You know, again, we have all kinds of different religions that uh, find it so easy to attribute human qualities to God. And alhamdulillah in Islam, we don't do, we don't do such thing. And obviously a heart that does not glorify Allah... That is not cognizant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a heart that is prone to making so many mistakes, to falling into so many uh, pitfalls. Number six, al wahsha another symptom. al wahsha means loneliness. Loneliness. You're surrounded by so many people, but you still feel you're not alone, but you're very, very lonely, right? You feel it just by yourself in this world. You have friends, you have siblings, you have parents, you have colleagues, classmates. Right? But you still feel lonely and you don't know why. Because the only friend that can take away loneliness from one's heart, heart is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if Allah is not your friend, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not your khalil, as he was to Ibrahim alayhi salam, nobody can feel that void whatsoever. And therefore people become vulnerable to psychological and psychiatric problems and anxiety and depression and so on and so forth. Let me talk a little bit about, uh, so these are the symptoms. I'll talk about causes, why does it happen? How much time do I still have? Um, Say 15 minutes? Yeah. Is that okay with everyone? <coughs> Why does qaswat al-qalb or the harshness of the heart take place? Number one, way too much attachment to dunya. Way too much attachment to this dunya. <clears throat> Here's what happens with, uh, with dunya, brothers and sisters. Dunya is supposed to be a, a place of temporary existence, right? But we don't treat it as such. We treat dunya as if it's a permanent place. If we, would, if we treat dunya as, a, as a, a place of temporary existence, we would have treated it the same way we would treat Chicago O'Hare Airport when we're there for a two-hour stop before we continue with our trip to Washington, D.C. If you think of dunya as you would think of O'Hare, then you truly grasp what it means and the true value of this life the life of this world. But what happens is that people go to O'Hare, they hire uh, 
they hire a uh, or uh, rent a house or even imagine imagine like literally going to O'Hare Airport and buying like a dwelling in the airport because you're staying there for two hours. Wouldn't that be like the the, the, the worst jerk you've ever you've ever seen in your life? Someone's actually buying a house at the airport because he's staying there for a couple of hours, and then that person starts buying a car. Well, you know, while I'm just moving around the airport, I, I, I need to drive, so I'm gonna buy a car, right? And you know, I'm here, might as well just you know get married, right? At O'Hare, right? And and all kinds of activities. And honestly, yes, O'Hare, you stay there for two hours. In Dunya, you stay for seventy years. But relatively speaking, it's the same thing. Right? It's a matter of how your heart perceives the whole thing. Am I here temporarily, or is this my final destination? That is the primary, that's the most fundamental question. Answer that question, you put your thumb on the problem. Answer this question, you figure it out. Is this the place of permanent or temporary existence? And what dunya does, I think, is that, you know, how, how many of you are pre-med? Quite a bit. What happens when, uh, when we take a, a, a drug, when we take a, a substance, when we consume substance for the first time, what happens on a an, narcotic? An it, it, it does it what it does, right? If you get high, it numbs your body, it puts you in, a, in a, an ecstatic state, whatever it does, right? But what happens next time? Can, you, can your body accept the exact dose that you took the first time? Why not? What happened to the nerve, the, the receptors? They get saturated, right? They get a little bit saturated. So next time to produce the same stimulation, you need more substance, right? What is that concept called in, in, in medicine? Tolerance. Who said it? How did the teacher? <coughs> So tolerance is when our nervous system gets saturated with a certain chemical, so next time we need a larger amount. So they start with, uh, with one sniff of heroin, you know, a couple of months later, they need to take like a handful in order for them to achieve, and that's, that's how people kill themselves eventually, in order for them to achieve the same, uh, the same and, and that's why they tell you, you know, people when they drink alcohol for the very first time, like just a little bit of beer, they get you drunk. Later in your career, as a drunk card, right, you go for 10 bottles and it doesn't affect you anymore. That's called tolerance, right? Chemically, it's called tolerance. Now, dunya does the same thing. It entices you to grab little crumbs, pieces here and there. Oh, take this, it's harmless. You can take that, it's nice. Oh, you accept this, it's good looking. Oh, this is maybe makro, but it's not haram, right? Allah hates it, but it's not haram. It's okay. So you keep taking these little small pieces here and there, it's a very gradual, very slow process, right? And eventually, you are in it to your ears. You're in dunya to your ears, and that becomes your place. And as the Tabi'in used to say, فَمَا يُبَارِ اللَّهُ فِي أَيُّ وَادٍ أَوْدِيَةِ الدُّنْيَا You know, once you reach that level, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not care which place on this earth you've perished. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not care anymore in which place on this earth you perished. You can die wherever because you, you die like a dog. You're, you've become nothing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you go down the slippery slope. You take one first step into the slippery slope and one thing leads to the other. You just can't, you can't climb back. You can't climb uh, back up anymore. Alright. Number two, heedlessness. Al-ghafla. Al-ghafla. And this is a malignant illness. Heedlessness. It metastasizes into your entire being until it completely destroys you. Heedless. Nothing affects you. Nothing changes your heart. Nothing causes you to make the right decisions. You walk around carrying your sin with you, doing it on a regular, consistent basis. Everyone sees it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees it year after year after year, and it doesn't deter you. How many people you know around you do this? Like they know they're doing something haram, and they continue to do it on a regular basis over and over and over again. People talk to them about it, 
They listen to a lecture about it. Someone sends them an email about it. The Khatib at the Masjid talks about it. There's a book that, that mentioned it. There's a relative that brought it up to them. Year after year after year. And heedlessness just reigns. Heedless reigns. They're not deterred. They, they continue to do it undeterred. Horrific attitude. Horrific. Number three. Failure to choose your company. Friends that surround you. What kind of people you're associated with. Oh, they're just my friends. I don't do what they do. But we have a common interest. We have, we, we, we like, we have similar hobbies or similar things that interest us. How many horrific things have been, have been committed because of that statement? In Islam, we don't associate with others because we have a common interest, right? We associate with others because they remind us of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They remind us of, of the deen. You know, they inspire us. Not that they beat us with a stick on the head, and not because they have a long beard, not because she has an extremely modest hijab. No. Not because they yell at us and tell us what we're doing is haram. No, because they inspire us. Because they inspire us. The way the Prophet ﷺ inspired people. He didn't beat people with a stick. He inspired them. He used the most beautiful and humble and loving and empathetic words to help people help themselves. Right? And it would take years sometimes for them to change. And the Prophet ﷺ would be patient. Just plant the seed. Plant the seed and let it grow and blossom on its own and let people make their own decisions. Don't expect immediate results. Oh, I gave that sister an advice not to do this and she's still doing it. Right? It never works that way. Good company is basically people who inspire you. Right? You wanna you wanna be looking for those people anywhere and everywhere and wanna stick with them and show up for as long as you can. <coughs> Forgetfulness of death. Forgetfulness of death. It's an inevitable thing, but many of us don't even want to talk about it. American culture has taught us that, you know, talking about death is a grim, this is a grim subject. We shouldn't be talking about it. It's depressing. We shouldn't be talking about this. And the Prophet ﷺ teaches us that out of all topics in this world, this is the one you want to be talking about. Uh, to yourself, not to other people, but to yourself, the most. Whenever the Prophet ﷺ would visit a, a graveyard, you know what he used to say? You know, Assalamu alaikum dar qawmi mu'mini. May the, plea, the, the peace be upon you, uh, the abode of believers. Right? Antum as wa nahnu insha'Allah bikum la You have just made it first, and eventually we will follow you. So he reminds himself when he, he's at the graveyard that one day he is going to be there. One day he's going to be there. I told this story so many times before, you know, maybe some of you heard it already. He was in Ramadan in 2005. And there was an Afghani brother who used to attend uh, Salat al-Taraweeh with us. And it was my first Ramadan in Sacramento. And, um, and, I, and I gave a khatira that night, one of the nights, about death. And I encouraged the brothers to, especially the brothers, Sisters are also you know, obviously allowed to go to the graveyard. But when it comes to the burial process itself, <coughs> usually brothers, you know, do it. They go inside the grave, right? And then they take the body and they place the body. So I, I encourage the brothers to actually do it. Guys, whenever there's a funeral, I, I advise you to actually go inside the grave and be the one who takes the body and places it, right? And you recite your Quran and then the brothers will help you up. And the feeling, when you're just getting out of the grave, the feeling is really going to be something, right? It's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be good for your soul, trust me. So I said this, and then like it was the 15th of Ramadan, and this brother came to me, and, and he was like, you know what, Imam Allahi, I did this, and, and it was the, the most in, incredible feeling, an exhilarating feeling. It was just like, when, when I did this, and it was a funeral, and I actually, I was the one who placed the body in, 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 in the grave, I think the moment, that moment changed my life, and I knew, you know, I am, I am putting someone there, you know, someday somebody will be putting my body in there, right? My turn will come one way or another, right? And brothers and sisters, before the end of Ramadan, that brother passed away. Before the end of that Ramadan, he was in his 40s. Before the end of that Ramadan of 2005, he passed away. That was seven years ago. <clears throat> and I keep telling people this story. 
Because of all the stories I've learned, nothing had a similar impact on me. I was saying these things to them, right? And he acted upon my advice, and he came and shared his story with me before the end of the month he was gone. And someone took his body and put it in the grave. So I told this, that story so many times, and it's just a matter of time, before someone sits here and addresses a similar audience and tells them, remember the story that the Imam used to say, well, he passed away, and someone put his body in the grave as well. You keep that in front of you all the time, I promise you. It's going to completely change your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's not a depressing thought, see? That's not depressing, that's not scary. Because death is about us going to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who loved us and loves us the most. Right? If that's how we're looking at it, that's going to be a reunion. There's nothing wrong with that. A couple of words, inshallah, on <coughs> therapy. Obviously, remembrance of death, you know, this goes without, uh, without saying. The Prophet says, أَكْفِرُ مِنْ ذِكْرِ هَذَا الْغَزَّةِ Remember the destroyer of pleasures as frequently as you can. That's a hadith. <coughs> Number two, uh, part of it is also visiting cemeteries and graveyards. You know, make it a habit. Well, like once a month. At least once a month. You know, there's a, there's a, a cemetery on uh, Jackson. Is it Jackson, I think? Uh, Jackson uh, in, in, uh, off of uh, Sunrise South. Just ask us, we'll give you directions. Just go there, attend a, bur a burial, attend a funeral service. You know, get yourself involved in the affairs of death. You know, learn about it, know about it, because you know, one day, one day it will come to you. That's inevitable. At tadabbur fil Quran, contemplating the verses of the Quran, uh, and you know, the habit of opening up the book and just reading and reading page after page after page. I consider that to be a complete waste. <coughs> Ask for my opinion, and please don't quote me on this because some people are going to get very upset. I think it's a complete waste when you keep, you know, like a parrot just reciting the verses of the Quran, not understanding them, not knowing them. I say, pick one ayah from the Quran once a week. See how easy that is? One ayah. Once a week, learn, learn it well. Know what it means. Read the tafsir, understand the meaning of the words. Contemplate, think about it. When you're driving your car, don't listen to Rush Limbaugh or, or Michael Savage and, and keep cursing them, right? As many brothers do, right? <laughs> don't listen to music, right? Don't listen to NPR. Don't listen to whatever it is that you listen to. Keep thinking. That's what Shaitan is trying to prevent you from doing. He doesn't want you to think. He wants you to be distracted and busy. Your mind is busy all the time with so f many frivolous things of life, right? He doesn't want you to think. But when you spend some time thinking, take that ayah and think about it. How it applies to your life. How can it change your life? Uh, how can it help you fight bad habits and acquire better habits and so forth? Once a week, in one year, you will be surprised of the results. The constant remembrance of the akhirah, the hereafter, right? Uh, this is also important, you know, the circumstances of the, of, of the end of time, the, 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 the day of judgment. Uh, heaven and hell, standing judgment before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the last Ramadan uh, at, at Salam. We covered this subject extensively. There's a series. It's about 25 lectures on this. And they're, they're on our website. If you guys would like to take a look at it, inshallah, inshallah, you'll find benefit. And then just please make it out for it. Uh, but, but thinking of the affairs of the hereafter is something that will definitely help bring life to this heart. Uh, think mentioning Allah's name, right? Whenever you're not doing anything important, keep saying SubhanAllah, keep saying La ilaha illallah, keep saying Bismillah, keep saying Allahu Akbar. There is a dhikr, there is a supplication for anything and everything. Keep pious people as friends. And even if they reject you, you, know, you impose yourself on it. The Quran says, Isbir you know, strive and perseverance around those who mention their Lord's name day and night. Muhasabatun nafs, holding your soul to account. Ask yourself of what you did. Punish yourself and reward yourself if you have to. What is the worst form of punishment? 
to do the exact opposite of what you what your soul wants to do. That's a form of punishment. So you want to sleep, stay up two or three extra hours and fight sleeping. That's your way of punishing your soul. When you do something else. See? It's a plan. And you say, inshallah, the first month I'm going to drop this habit. And I'm going to acquire that habit. Right? Keep trying and trying and trying. When you fall, right? Punish yourself. And do something that you hate the most. You see, this is why the scholars say, uh, the therapy for the illnesses of the heart are so, is so difficult. Why? Because you have to be your own doctor. And you have to kind of you know, go against what you really want. And you have to overcome your own weaknesses. There's no one else that's going to tell you what you're supposed to do. Right? It's just you. And when you actually do well, reward yourself. And, and give yourself something of what it wants. As long as it's for that. <coughs> was a was a couple of more thoughts, but I think I think I'll just leave it at this, inshallah, and let you uh, ponder upon what I have given you already. And um, let me take inshallah a couple of questions if you, if you guys have any. <coughs> question and um, I guess this this pertains what I said pertains primarily to uh, the choices of the company we make consciously uh, uh, however there could be some family members that are literally just there they're imposed upon us we can't do anything about it you know cousin or sibling or whatever that have a very negative impact on us right that's a, that's a fact of life that we that we have to deal with. And it's a balance between two things. Number one, the right of kin, the you know, a silat al rahim they call, it, because that's a right they have on us, right? On the other hand, that needs to be balanced out with uh, my fear that my heart can get completely corrupted, right? So if if you have family members, for instance, that watch programming on television that you deem inappropriate, you should not embark upon something like that. You should not. You shouldn't sit in the living room while they're doing it. But you still need to show them the respect, the compassion, the love that they uh, that they are deserving of you, without necessarily engaging with them in activities that would eventually just cause your heart to be corrupted even more. Uh, so you, you have to find a way to strike that balance. Uh, and you don't push them away too much because now you're being overbearing. You're being arrogant. You're you're you you you. you being self-righteous, you think you're better than them, right? So they're not going to learn anything from you. They're going to completely shun you. Uh, on the other hand, if you if you get way too engaged with them in their activities, that might corrupt your heart. So just find a, a fine line to walk and, and, and pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides you. really understand you within the week, just have that goal in mind. You mentioned that. Where would you recommend that we start? I would say start with the, with the shorter surahs of the Quran. I would say start with the 30th juice of the Quran and just you know, make it an opportunity to learn and to possibly memorize. Because when you keep thinking of one ayah every week, I think eventually you memorize it. Uh, and and there, is a, there is a reason why the the most spiritual surahs of the Qur'an are also the shortest ones and the ones that have that were revealed in the very early stages of the messages. They're short, they're potent, they're straightforward, they're easy to memorize, they are very eloquent, they're extremely powerful and beautiful, uh, they are the Orion, you know, so, so many qualities of Mecca and Qur'an that you see in those, uh, in those shorter surahs, as opposed to longer surahs that talk about the inheritance laws and and so forth. So I, I would certainly go with uh, with uh, with the Amr and Salun all the way down until sort of this. Any 
Any other questions? Yes. So you're talking about the uh, forgetfulness of debt. Um, so what happens when that progresses in some individuals at least to the point where it completely like for instance, I heard a report about those people, kids who take steroids, and they don't care about the fact that it's going to reduce their lifespan to the point that they might only live past their twenties. You know, for that hardness, like that hardness of heart, what is the solution? What is the therapy for that? What is that loss cost? That that's a very good question. Uh, see, in Islam. In Islam, there's always a balance between two extremes when it comes to the illnesses of art. Actually, there was a, I conducted a, a series of workshops on this like four years ago. So, for example, one extreme right here is um, stinginess. That's an illness of the heart, right? What is the other extreme of stinginess? Hmm? Overspending? Extravagance. Extravagance? So this is a continuum, right? What does Islam preach? Moderation, Moderation right? So what's the, what's a good word for that? Generosity. Frugality? Frugality, so they spend, but they spend on necessary things. They're not stingy. When, when it's uh, a fundraiser at the masjid, they donate, right? Um, let's, let's use another example. Uh, promiscuity. <coughs> As one extreme. What is the other extreme of promiscuity? Celibacy. Hmm? Celibacy. Celibacy. Are these two accepted Islamically? Yes? No? Are they? What, it, what does Islam preach? What is it called? Marriage. Marriage? <laughs> <coughs> Let's use another example. Um, how about arrogance? What is the extreme of arrogance? Or the other extreme, the other end of the continuum. I can think of uh, timidity. You don't stand up for yourself. You let people trample all over you, right? What is this? Does Islam preach, you know, giving people the right cheek? They don't preach that. That's not that's not an Islamic teaching. If someone slaps you on the cheek, you slap him on on his cheek, right? But what does Islam preach? Humility. Hmm? Humility. Humility. Right? So, we're not supposed to swing the pendulum all the way to the other extreme in order to cure the illness of the heart. As a matter of fact, when you do that, you're going to swing it to another illness. This is why it's so dangerous. You see, that's another dimension. It's just that there's no time to cover all the tops. But there's another dimension of why Curing the illnesses of the heart is so difficult because if you work on it way too much, it pushes the other extreme, and then you have another problem, right? How do you bring? How how can you control the pendulum effect so it goes like this, and then it stabilizes in the middle, right? That's the biggest question. So with your question, if forgetfulness of death is right over here, the other extreme is I don't know suicidal behavior. What's that? <coughs> yeah, so being indifferent, I think it would be here, right? This is indifference on the continuum, <coughs> right? Very close to suicidal. But what does Islam preach? Preaches the remembrance of death. So we're supposed to conduct our lives in a moderate and a balanced way, right? We don't gorge on mass amounts of food, but we don't starve ourselves either. Right? As the Quran said. There's always moderation is key in everything. They, they actually talk about diets. Right? They talk about exercise. Oh, eliminate your carbs. Eliminate your fat. Eliminate meat. You know, you can't eat this, you can't eat... No. 
Balance and moderation in anything is key. Eat anything and drink anything except that which is haram, as long as it's in moderate amounts. That's what the Prophet did. So we're supposed to remember that in a way that will not cause us to be uh, suicidal or depressed or indifferent to life or death. And we're not supposed to completely forget about death, that we work so hard for dunya and forget that there is a hero. Right? So again, it's a matter of working so hard to make sure that your pendulum doesn't swing all the way to the other extreme. Questions? Yes? What about the drinking of juice with sheikh? Like, you go to the sheikh, he told you that's a bidah, and you go to the other sheikh, he told you that the other sheikh was in trouble for something. So, like, you keep doing the confusing. If someone tells you the other sheikh is retarded, like, you don't want to listen to this. <laughs> no, but to answer your question, how do we how do we deal with confusions? How, how do we deal with the confusions of life, the inherent confusions of theology, and and the diversity in Islamic tradition, in Islamic theological and intellectual tradition? There is a, a massive amount of diversity that is true, and the way to deal with this, and I tell you, this is your litmus test that will never ever fail you. Right? It is this guy right here. It's your fitra. Your fitra will always tell you the right answer. Ask five people and then sit down and ask your heart. Your heart will always tell you the right answer. But what if your heart was actually deceased or your fitra was kind of messed up? Then you are not worrying about the question in the first one. If your fitra has already been corrupted, if the compass is dysfunctional, that means you're not you're not even there. You're not asking the question to begin with. So the, you go to a sheikh and he says, you know, this and that is haram, and they go to another this and that is halal, whatever. Ask yourself. But see, trying to ask yourself without information, it will put you in a state of peril. It's just as bad, right? It's just as bad. So you want to collect as much information as possible and then sit down and make a decision about it. <coughs> If a sheikh, for example, uh, you know, when I was when I was a kid, I went to uh, I went to my Quran teacher, and I asked him about music, right? You know, again, I was I was like you know in uh, in fourth or fifth grade, and the other shiuk the masjid words, which someone saying music is haram, someone saying music is halal. Oh, it's okay to use uh, the the drums. Oh, it's not okay to use this. It's okay to use that. So I was really confused. So I asked him. What do you think about music? And here's what he did. He 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 grabbed his, his keychain. You guys can I can I borrow someone's keychain? I think the left line is my Thank you. Thank you. He grabbed his keychain. Well, this is a true story. I was in fourth grade. And he did this. He said this. He went like this. Is this haram? That's what he said. That's what he said. Is this haram? So I said, don't think so. <laughs> so he went like this. Is this haram? So I said, I don't think so. So he said, okay, is this haram? It doesn't sound how long to me. <laughs> so he kept going like through this demonstration, just using my mind, right? He asked me, are you familiar with the opinions on music? I said, yes. Did you read about them? I said, yes. Did you ask other scholars? I said, yes. He said, if you have all this information, now ask yourself. Ask your mind. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put a beautiful sound in every aspect of his creation. Everything that we can call beautiful out there in God's creation has some a sound of sorts. Just because we're putting those sounds in a rhythmic manner, that can that in and of itself make it wrong or reprehensible? I said, well, I don't think that it would be wrong because of that. He said, if you sit listening to the chirps of the birds all day long, and you abandon your family, and you don't do your salah, 
and you forget about your work and your responsibilities and all that. Would that be wrong or, or right? So I said it would be wrong. So he asked me, because, of, because the chirps of the birds are bad or because abandoning your responsibilities is bad? So I said, no, it's the latter, not the former. So he said, this is, this is how you should be thinking about music. Right? That was not, he did not quote a hadith, he did not tell me an ayah. Again, there's so many scholars saying music is haram. And, and I absolutely respect their opinions, right? And I approach this matter with the utmost humility, because you know what? If I'm wrong, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides to punish me because I preach this stuff, right? And, I, and I, 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 I tell people about my position on these things. So if I'm wrong and I'm getting other people in trouble with me, all of us are going to be in great trouble. So I approach it with, with humility. I'm not attacking or cursing anyone who says otherwise, but I'm saying, based on, on the data that I have, and based on the information I collected over the years, and the schools of thought I've, I've studied, and the scholars I've asked, and the research I have done, and after all of that, using my own fitra, I realized that clean, appropriate music cannot in and of itself be haram. Right? That's the position I adhere to. And it is not because my shaykh told me. Right? That is not fly before, it's not going to fly before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You do something wrong in the life of this world, you stand before Allah, asks you, why did you do it? He said, because my shaykh told me, I promise you, he's not, he's not going to accept that. <coughs> if you, if you, tonight, if you decide that you're going to start listening to music that is clean, you know, I don't know the 40th symphony of Beethoven or, or Bach or, or Johann Strauss, if you decide to do that, tonight, and, and, and it turns out to be the wrong thing, and you stand before Allah and you tell him, well, the imam at the lecture said it was okay, I promise you, it's not going to serve you. The answer is not going to serve you. It has to, the conviction has to come from your heart, right? And that's, I think that's the beauty of Islam. And, and if we have that approach, and we, we, we take it with humility, with respect to others who think otherwise, and to be open to change our judgment if better evidence presents itself, then inshallah ta'ala, even if we reach wrong conclusions, we might have something to say to Allah on the day of judgment. Thank you, sister. Are there any more questions? Oh, there are questions. Yes. So, are there any specific guidelines in regards to the thought of mind or frame of mind while being vigorous towards Salah? We're taught to have mutual and devotion in like what we're reciting. So how would you approach that? One of my teachers actually used to say, uh, when you make your dhikr, when you do your supplication, you shouldn't do more than once every minute. Let me repeat that. So you say, subhanAllah. My, one of my teachers used to say, don't say more than once, subhanAllah, in one minute. Why did he say that? Because he wanted me to say it and then focus on its meaning and try to understand it and ponder upon it. So you say, SubhanAllah, and start understanding what it means to rid Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of all human qualities, of all human attributes, of all weaknesses, of all earthly things, right? And how to think of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as, as an entity that is above and beyond your imagination, your thinking, I mean, that will achieve multiple things. Number one, <coughs> it will make you in a state of awe of the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two, it will make you actually yearning to meet Him. Because I don't know who He is or what He is here in dunya, but I wish, I hope that one day I will be able to know. Right? Because in Jannah, we will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and see His face, right? Uh, and, and so, you actually look forward to that opportunity. This puzzle that is Allah, right? That is that is so accessible, but yet so inaccessible, that is so understandable, but yet so unfathomable, right? This Allah that I worship, and I love, and I pray, and I talk to every day, yeah, inshallah, one day, when I go to Jannah, I'll be able to know all about it. See, that's, all of that just subhanAllah. So you keep saying, subhanAllah, 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 subhanAllah. I'm not sure if that's going to be very helpful. So if you actually like, in your Tasbih regimen every day, you only said SubhanAllah like three times from your heart, and, and you really thought about it, and it made an impact, it made a difference, 
that I think has more barakah than 500 subhanAllah that, that only your tongue was engaged in and not in. <coughs> so that's just one small tip, you know, don't just say it. You know, try to say it slowly and only say one dhikr every minute so that you actually have some time to think about it. There was one last hymn. I, I can take one more question. Sure. Yes. As a costume, I find it a little challenging and difficult to detach um, myself from like um, the current of the neck. And I was wondering, how can I um, incorporate myself more into me and not be bogged down by all these vignette, or all these ideas of the Good question. Uh, let me let me say this. I I I will share with you. You know some of the some of my own challenges. You know on, on my job <coughs> and, and with the things that I have to deal with on a regular basis. So so I have I have my I have my job. I have the community. I have uh, leading the prayers. I have preparing for Jum'ah. I have preparing for classes that some of you attend. I have to uh, basically act as a spokesperson, the spokesman for our for our masjid, <coughs> and you know. Quite frequently for the entire community, uh, I have uh, you know all kinds of, of um, video uh, programming that I do at Access Channel and RCC TV and so forth, uh, and then I have uh, the counseling, you know, meeting with people who have issues with their wives, uh, marriage and divorce issues, uh, and then you have um, youth activities, and then you have uh, social events and social activities, and everyone's birthday. You know, they invite you, everyone's the main party, they invite you, you know, everyone's whatever, whatever, they invite you. Uh, and uh, so you, you have the, the work of the community, and then I have myself. I need to increase my knowledge, I need to learn more, I need to read more, I need to get more exposed, because every time the community comes to listen, they expect a lecture that is better than last time, because they, they base your performance against the standard from last week, right? So it just, you know, the expectations keep building, and that's why, I don't know if you've noticed, you know, every once in a while, I just have to invite a very bad speaker, speaker <laughs> to reset the, the, the standards. <laughs> I start from a, uh, from the baseline, and then, and then build it up again, you know, so I don't do that deliberately. <laughs> uh, but, but the point is, on top of all that, I have my family, I have my wife, and I have my kids, and I need to teach them. I cannot be teaching everyone else in the community and ignoring my own family. I have my extended family, I have my relatives, uh, and so forth. And then, you know, because I'm of, of Egyptian heritage, I have the, the issues in Egypt, I have the political process, I have political parties that, that uh, you know, that I write policy analysis and recommendations for. Uh, I have, uh, you know, other hobbies and other uh, uh, activities that I would like to personally do. I have exercise that I need to uh, also keep on my calendar as well. I mean, under no circumstance would the busyness of your life reach 10% of mine. And I am still able to juggle all these balls with, with the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I, I know when to say no. I've learned that it takes time, honestly. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I wasn't like this a few years ago. It takes time and it takes discipline and experience to learn how to do all this, right? To learn when to say no, to learn to compartmentalize and categorize things in your, in your life. Saturday is for family, right? Like Imam Hanifa used to do. Uh, uh, Sunday is, is for the youth and, and for, you know, directly teaching, you know, my own little group. Uh, some of whom are also here with us tonight. And then five days of the week, uh, that's for everything else. And then I have Tuesdays, right? Is only for uh, my own uh, personal activities. It is for you know my overseas uh, uh, involvements and so forth. Uh, half of Thursday is, is exclusively for preparing the khutbah. Friday morning is exclusively for preparing the khutbah. And the rest of Friday, you know, I basically catch up on email and, and things like that. I have uh, I have a very clear exercise regimen that I have been following, alhamdulillah, for, you know, not 100% consistently, uh, but you, you can imagine, you know, I, I get invited everywhere. 
uh, and then people force you to eat, right? And you know, Arabs especially, like they threaten that they will divorce you if they're white. If you don't, I swear to God, this is literally right? <laughs> You have to finish your food, right? So, you know, you cannot jeopardize a marriage. So, so I have to maintain my own exercise regimen. Otherwise, you know, I'm going to be, you know, it's going to be very unhealthy for me. And so, it, it's an act of God. I don't know what you want to call it, but there is a way to do it, right? I have, I have two hours every week, sometimes an hour and a half, in which I go uh, on a trail that is as remote as possible. From, from where I live, from where I work, and that's where I walk, and I think, and I, and I leave my cell phone in the car, and I think of nothing but nature, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, I contemplate upon my own sins, my own weaknesses, uh, things that I need to do with my life, challenges, nothing to do with work, right? Just me as a person. So uh, there is a way to do it. And, and as a student, I think, uh, inshallah ta'ala, you, know, you have a lot more time right now, on your hands right now, a lot more time than I, than I do, and I think it's probably going to do it. Thank you so much.